Hello everyone, this is Professor Roman. Let's continue the group theory lectures. We've been talking about the family of symmetric groups in the last two lectures, and I want to conclude that discussion by proving that the alternating groups A n are simple as long as n is not equal to 4. That's the only exception. Recall that a group is simple if its only normal subgroups are the two that every group has, the trivial subgroup and the full group itself. So no non-trivial proper normal subgroups. The proof of the simplicity of AN for n different from 4, there are, there are a great many such proofs, and they tend to divide into two groups, the inductive proofs and the non-inductive proofs. The inductive proofs, in my experience, the ones I've seen, uh, tend to require a bit more mathematical machinery. <clears throat> and the non-inductive proofs, oh, and they also require a uh, separate proof that AN is simple in order to establish the basis for the induction. And inductive proofs in general are not as informative or enlightening as non-inductive proofs. On the other hand, the non-inductive proofs often receive some criticism for being too computational. Of course, that's always a matter of judgment. They are, in some sense, computational. But despite these criticisms, a direct proof that a n is simple for, let's say, n bigger than or equal to 5 is an easy consequence of the properties of conjugation. And so I prefer to give you a direct proof in order to make that point clear. <clears throat> For the proof, we will require the theorem we discussed in the last lecture, and I've rewritten it here because, uh, strictly speaking, the previous section was optional. <clears throat> if n is bigger than or equal to 5, then all three cycles are conjugate in a n. In particular, if n is a non-trivial normal subgroup of a n that contains a three cycle, then n has to be the full alternating group a n. So this is the tool we're going to use to show that a n has no non-trivial proper normal subgroups. Proof here is just a couple lines long. This is computational in the sense that um, you know, you might look at this and say, well, who thought of that? Okay. And I'm going to let you read that for yourself. We gave a proof in the previous lecture. If you followed that, then you know. I'm going to leave it for you to show that AN is not simple, that it has a non-trivial proper normal subgroup, and that AN is simple for N less than or equal to 3. And so we're going to assume from this point on that n is bigger than or equal to 5. The plan for the proof is as follows. To show that a n is simple for n bigger than or equal to 5, we have to show that if n is a non-trivial normal subgroup of a n, then n in fact equals a n. So it's non-proper. But this theorem I just quoted to you tells us that an is generated by the three cycles, and so all we need to show is that n contains a single three cycle. Because n is normal, any conjugate of that three cycle will be in n. And that's how we get all three cycles. All three cycles are conjugate in a n. 
So that's the focus of our attention. We are given a non-trivial normal subgroup N of AN. All we need to do is show that it contains a 3-cycle. Now here is the crux of the proof. As it happens, there is a simple way to reduce any cycle of length 4 or greater, and I've written it this way to identify these three elements, A, B, C, the rest are x1 through xk minus 3. So this has length k. Okay. And k is at least 4, which means there's, a, there's at least one of these x's. There's a simple way to reduce any k cycle where k is bigger than or equal to 4 to a 3 cycle using only alpha itself, alpha inverse, and conjugation by an even permutation. So everything can take place in an. Well, of course, if k is a 4 cycle, that's not in an but the algebra still works, okay? Now, how do we discover this? <clears throat> well, we want to, we, we have an arbitrary cycle of length k, at least four. We want to do something to that cycle, do some algebra, and produce a three cycle. Now, this may seem very naive, but we can easily reduce alpha to a one cycle. Just take alpha inverse alpha, which would look like this. That's the identity. That's a one cycle. So we went too far. So that doesn't seem to be too useful on the surface, but it's it's, we don't want to be too hasty because it does give us an idea maybe a different arrangement of these three symbols CBA a reordering of these will prevent the total collapse to a one cycle maybe even produce a three cycle So it, let's just put three question marks here. And these are going to be A, B, C in some order. <clears throat> and this is, this is sigma. This was sigma before we possibly reordered C, B, A to a different order. If you look at this for a minute, you will see that it does fix x1 through x k minus 4. For example, x1 goes to x2, x2 then goes back to x1, so x1 is fixed. This works all the way up to the x just before the last one. x sub k minus 4 goes to x sub k minus 3, and that gets sent back to x sub k minus 4. So the k minus 4 elements, x1 through xk minus 4, are fixed. So we do have a, re a serious reduction to a permutation whose support has size at most 4. We want it to be size 3. Any arrangement of these symbols a, B, and C in, uh, I'm sorry, I called this sigma, I meant to call it alpha. Yeah, I called it. In alpha inverse can be obtained by conjugating alpha inverse by a permutation lambda of this set, A, B, C. Because lambda, if it only permutes A, B, and C, fixes everything else, it's going to fix all these x's. So when I take alpha inverse conjugate by lambda, this is alpha inverse conjugate by lambda. I get lambda c, lambda b, lambda a, and these x's are all the same. They don't move. 
Now we want lambda to be in an because ultimately we're doing everything in the alternating group. And that only leaves two choices for alpha, uh, for lambda. These are the only permutations of A, B, and C that are even. The cycle ABC, the cycle ACB. Well, actually, both of these work. They do exactly what we need. Alpha inverse conjugate, conjugate by ABC times alpha. This is, instead of C A CBA, it's now ACB. And the rest is the same, and we get a three cycle. If we conjugate by ACB, we also get a three, a different three cycle. So for any cycle alpha of length at least four, this permutation, alpha inverse conjugate by ABC times alpha, is a three cycle. Okay, so that's the algebra. That's what I was referring to earlier by some, some relatively simple uh, algebra with conjugation. So now to the business at hand, suppose that the cycle decomposition of a permutation sigma in N contains this three this cycle of length four or more so it could be other cycles involved as well what happens when we form this same expression sigma inverse conjugate by alpha sigma well when we conjugate sigma sigma can be written as alpha as beta alpha Alpha is this cycle, and beta is the rest of the cycle decomposition. It is disjoint from alpha. So um, sigma to the lambda is, alpha, is beta alpha to the lambda. Beta is not moved by conjugation by lambda. So we get this. So now when we uh, expand this, I'll let you do the algebra yourself. It's the same as um, these should be alphas. It's the same as alpha inverse conjugate by lambda alpha, and we get a three cycle. So let's summarize what we've got so far. If sigma in SN has a cycle decomposition that includes a cycle alpha of length k, uh, uh, length k greater than or equal to 4, so we can write sigma as beta alpha, or beta, and this is alpha written out, and beta and alpha are disjoint, then this permutation is a 3 cycle. So, if a normal subgroup N of AN contains such a permutation, then it contains a three cycle, and so it's all of AN. So, we have dispatched the case where N contains any permutation whose cycle structure includes a cycle of length four or more. From that point, we can produce a three cycle, and therefore, n must be all of an. <clears throat> now we have to consider the remaining possibilities, which are that n contains only permutations whose cycle decomposition contains only three cycles and or transpositions. Also one cycles, but those aren't going to interfere with anything. 
So the first possibility, suppose now that n contains a permutation sigma whose cycle decomposition contains two or more three cycles. So I can write sigma as alpha, beta, pi. Alpha is a three cycle, beta is a three cycle, pi is the rest of the cycle decomposition. And all three of these are pairwise disjoint. Then for any even permutation lambda that's disjoint from pi, we don't know what pi is, we don't have any handle on it, so I want to be disjoint from pi so I don't have to worry about it. This same computation, sigma inverse conjugate by lambda sigma, uh, when you expand this, it will look like this. Beta inverse conjugate by lambda, alpha inverse conjugate by lambda, alpha beta. Hopefully, some choice of a three-cycle lambda will produce a k-cycle of length k bigger than or equal to three. If it produces a three-cycle, we're done. If it produces a cycle of length at least four, we appeal to what we just discovered, there will still be a three cycle. So how do we find a suitable choice for lambda? Well, we'd like, it'd be nice if we had something like the, the three cycle ABC again. We do need an even permutation of A, B, and C. So it's got to be either A, B, C, or A, C, B. In other words, it's got to be either alpha or alpha inverse. So alpha will commute, uh, sorry, lambda will commute with alpha because it's either equal to alpha or alpha inverse. It will also commute with beta because it's, um, because it's alpha is disjoint from beta, and therefore so is alpha inverse. So we now have a three-cycle lambda that commutes with alpha and beta. When we take a look at the result of this, everything collapses to the identity because now everything is commuting. So that's not what we want. It's kind of reminiscent of what happened before when we just took alpha inverse alpha. We're going to have the same problem if we take a cycle, three cycle involving x, y, and z. Again, we're going to get a collapse of this to the identity. So that tells us that in looking for a three cycle, we better grab something from the support, from the supports of both alpha and beta. So let's try A, X, Y. And we've got to take uh, two elements from one of, the, of alpha or beta and one element from the other. So by symmetry, this is really the only shot we have. We do the same computation again, and lo and behold, we get a five cycle. That's all we need. We appeal to the previous theorem. N now contains a permutation whose cycle decomposition, if it contains, uh, let me say that again, if n contains a permutation whose cycle decomposition contains a product of two or more three cycles, it will contain a five cycle and therefore a three cycle by the previous theorem. And so again, n will be an. So we've dispatched the case where the cycle decomposition contains a cycle of length four or more or two three cycles.
what's left? <clears throat> well, the case where n contains only permutations whose cycle decomposition consists of one cycles, transpositions, and at most one three cycle. But if there is a three cycle, we can write our permutation sigma as C T1 through Tm. We've, don't bother to write the one cycles. C is the three cycle, and the T's are transpositions. If we square it, remember transpositions are involutions, and all these things commute, because this is the cycle decomposition. Sigma squared is C squared. But C squared is the three cycle. If C is a three cycle, so is its square. So we've got a three cycle, n is equal to a n. So we're left then with the case where every non identity permutation, I should have used that term non identity here too. <clears throat> that every non-identity permutation in N is a product of disjoint transpositions. In this case, every non-identity element of N is an involution. And way back at the beginning of this course, we proved that, or I think I asked you to prove that if a group has the property that all of its non-identity elements are involutions, order two, then the group's abelian. So in this case, our normal subgroup N is also abelian. Maybe we can show that that is not possible. And then this case would be eliminated completely. So an arbitrary non-identity element of N is just a product of disjoint transpositions. And uh, there are an even number of them. M is even because it belongs to A N. Factors are disjoint. Can we produce another permutation in N, so using conjugation, that does not commute with sigma? That's all we'd need to do. Well, the good guess would be that all we need to do is sort of shuffle the elements in sigma around a little bit, and that might break commutativity with sigma. So this is all pretty vague. It's kind of a wish list, an idea. The place to start in a situation like this is with the simplest case, because if that doesn't work, then we know the whole thing is no good. So let's just take m equals 2, and we'll have two transpositions. Well, <clears throat> there are only four elements here. So there's, at least, there's an, at least one other element in In, because right, uh, we're talking about the alternating group An, where n is at least 5. So there's an, there's an x that's not equal to any of these. And we could incorporate x into sigma by conjugation this way. Tau equals sigma conjugate by a1, a2, x. That's even permutation. It will give us this product of transpositions. Now we're in trouble here. Tau and sigma are not going to commute. <coughs> tau sigma of x is b2. Sigma tau of x is a2. We've broken commutativity. Okay. So in the case m equals 2, we didn't have you know, a huge amount of trouble showing that 
uh, n cannot be abelian, and therefore we have a contradiction. In this case, does not happen. If m is bigger than or equal to 4, then we can take sigma and conjugate by this 3 cycle, a1, a2, a3. That's going to scramble a1, a2, and a3. See, we may not have access to an element that's not in sigma, then support of sigma anymore. So the argument we use for m equals 2 may fail. So we have to just try a scrambling of the elements we have rather than introducing a new element. <clears throat> when you do this conjugation, you replace a1 by a2, a2 by a3, a3 by a1, and it looks like this. And again, tau sigma and sigma tau are not the same. They send a1 to different places. So, this case, where n contains only permutations whose cycle structures are products of transpositions, cannot happen. And we are done. A n is simple for all n bigger than or equal to 5. That's what we just proved, and I asked you to check it for a1, a2, and a3. So it's true for all n different from 4. Okay. I hope you will go over this proof a couple of times. Uh, it, it really it may seem complicated, or maybe complex is a better word, but if you go over it a couple times, you'll see we're just doing some simple algebra with... Uh, inverses and conjugates. Uh, it may seem a little difficult to have discovered this in the first place, and I can agree with you on that, but it is not deep mathematics. It is based on the properties of conjugation in the alternating group, in the symmetric group, in fact. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the normal subgroups of Sn. The consequences of the fact that Sn, at least for n different from 4, contains a simple gigantic subgroup, An, are quite severe. An, as we know, is a gigantic subgroup of Sn, therefore it's normal in Sn. But as long as n is different from 4, this gigantic subgroup has no normal subgroups of its own. Therefore, any non-trivial, proper, normal subgroup N of Sn, now the full symmetric group, cannot be completely contained in An, in the gigantic subgroup An. So it's half in and half out. But the half-in portion, and intersect An, is normal in An. But An is simple. So this intersection is either trivial or all of An. Only two possibilities. In the former case, the half-in part has size 1, therefore N itself has order 2. It consists of the identity and an odd permutation of order 2. That's going to be, seems like that's that such a subgroup is going to be uh, rather difficult for it to be normal uh, in Sn, and I'm going to leave you to consider that as an exercise. It's not possible for that to be normal. So the only so that rules out this possibility, it leaves only n equals a n. And that means that a n is the only non-trivial, proper, normal subgroup of the symmetric group S n. Okay. 
So to summarize, we have shown that for n different from 4, a n has no non-trivial proper normal subgroups, and that s n has only one non-trivial proper normal subgroup, namely a n itself, the alternating group. Very seldom is it so easy to determine the normal subgroups of a class of groups. Okay. Problem is, in a, in a sense, the symmetric groups are so complex, containing as they do copies of all groups, that normality, which is a rather strict condition, doesn't happen very often at all. In fact, only once, and that is the gigantic subgroup AN.